Welcome, ladies and gentlemen of the internet, to the first episode of Sunday School. On this new show, I plan to talk about issues ranging all across the spectrum of theology and apologetics. And our first topic this week is going to be freedom from a Christian perspective. Now this discussion is going to build a little bit off of my most recent hot take video where I discussed the meaning of the terms liberty and freedom. So if, if you haven't watched it yet, definitely go check it out. It's quite informative if I do say so myself. I will put the link down in the description of this video. So just what does freedom mean from a Christian perspective? Well you might be surprised to know that the Bible actually talks about freedom a lot. Here's just a few examples of Bible verses that talk about freedom. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Galatians 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Acts chapter 13, verse 39 says, Through him everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Now, primarily what these verses are getting at are what we Christians refer to as freedom from sin and freedom in Christ. More specifically, these things are referring to freedom from the constraints of certain aspects of Old Testament law and freedom from the supernatural consequences of sin. Thus, uh, basically, that would be hell. Yet, in spite of the fact that the Bible talks about freedom in these areas and elsewhere, many think of it as counterintuitive to say that the Bible promotes freedom. And to be honest, it's not hard to see why. After all, the Ten Commandments, one of the things that people, Christian and non-Christian alike, are most familiar with in the Bible, are a list of things that are sinful, a list of things that we shall not do. And even on top of those ten, there's far more things in the Bible that it is, at the very least, if not outright sinful, strongly suggested that would we would be wise to refrain from doing. In fact, ironically enough, the very first sin was Eve and then Adam making the free choice to eat of the tree of good and evil. So how can one claim to be a Christian and yet also claim to be free? Well, the answer to that lies in the fact that our culture has a fundamental misunderstanding of what freedom truly means. People tend to think that freedom and liberty mean simply doing whatever you please with no impediments or consequences, similar to the positive liberty concept that I discussed in my most recent hot take. The issue is that is not actually the case. Freedom. True freedom, that is, the kind that the Bible talks about, is not simply having no boundaries or no restrictions at all, but rather it's the ability to decide for yourself which boundaries you place on yourself and which rules you will follow. Specifically in the Christian sense, it means choosing to follow God's edicts. It seems odd on the face of it, but if you really examine it, it starts to make sense. As a Christian who has struggled with lust, I know all too well how it feels to do things that you know logically and morally are wrong, but yet you feel compelled to do them anyway. Now that's not to say that myself or anyone else doesn't bear responsibility for our actions. We most certainly do. In the case of myself and lust, there's many things that I can do to prevent myself from getting in situations where the temptation to lust is irresistible. Whenever I stubbornly refuse to do them, that's on me. But the reason that I bring that up is to make the point that there most definitely are situations, and I think we've all been in one at some time or another, where emotions and other urges, physical and otherwise, can override our rational thought capabilities and make us do things that we otherwise might not do. And it's in these moments where you realize what it means to be what the Bible calls a slave to sin. 
And it's not that you're being mind controlled by an outside force or anything like that. But in these sorts of situations, the emotions that you're feeling and the physical urges that you're feeling are just so overpowering that even while you are simultaneously thinking that, you know, hey, this is a bad idea or, hey, this is wrong, I shouldn't do this, the emotional voice still wins out. And it's not just religious people who experience things like this. Pretty much all of us know of a time where our emotions got the best of us or we were under the influence of drugs or alcohol and did something that we knew was wrong and that we wish we could take back. And the more often that we give in to our passions, the more often that we give in to our base emotional desires, the more this type of thing happens. And that begs the question, if we allow ourselves to be ruled by our emotions and by our passions, then in practice, how free are we really? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 kind of reinforces this idea of being ruled by your passions or sinful desires as being equivalent to slavery. It says, They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Now, whereas you can become less free in effect by letting your passions rule you. If you choose to follow God, or if you choose to set limits on your behavior, counterintuitive as it may sound, you actually end up being more free. Now the reason for this is because when we exercise self-discipline and we place restrictions on ourselves, we can help avoid the number of situations we face where we are so tempted by our passions that we are overcome by them. A good example would be a married man trying to avoid the sin of adultery. Because the truth is, very few men, no matter how committed to their wives they may be, are going to be capable of resisting sexual advances from an attractive woman if that woman manages to get them alone and isolated. And even though said men would des desire very strongly not to cheat on their wives if the temptation weren't staring them in the face... In the heat of the moment, their passion and their sinful desire is probably going to win out. So in order to avoid such a situation where a man would become slave to his passions rather than his rational thought capability, a man might, for example, choose to not be alone with uh, members of the opposite sex. He might choose to stay in separate hotels than women that he works with if he's got to go on a business trip or just things like that. And to be clear, it's not to say that a man is being sinful if he doesn't choose to do those things. It's just these are examples of some restrictions that a man might place on themselves in order to avoid this particular sin. But in this scenario, even though the man is placing a restriction on himself, which you would think would make someone less free, it's a voluntary decision put in place to prevent him from being in the situation where his rational thought capability is not going to win out. So in practice, because he is making the voluntary decision at a point where his rational thought capability is engaged, and thus preventing a situation where his rational thought capability is not engaged. He's actually freer because he's making decisions in a context where he has more control over his actions. So in short, if we want to experience true freedom for ourselves, we need to learn to set boundaries for ourselves based on God's word. Because as Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And with that, school is out for this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit that like button, share it with your friends, subscribe, and hit the little bell to get notifications on when I do new videos. This is going to be an ongoing series where I hope to delve into topics of Christian apologetics, theological issues, matters of faith, or really just any sort of questions that one might face on their Christian journey, or questions that you might have as a non-believer kind of trying to figure out 
exactly what this Christianity stuff is and why anybody would believe it. But uh, so that's that's the plan going forward. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll talk to you again soon.